ever had one of those days where you're like, what else, Lord? Water breaks. <laughs> and there she gave birth to her firstborn son. After wrapping the newborn baby in strips of cloth, they laid him in a feeding trough since there was no available space in any upper room in the village. That night, in a field near Bethlehem, there were shepherds watching over their flocks. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared in radiant splendor before them, lighting up the field with the blazing glory of God, and the shepherds were terrified. But the angel reassured them, saying, Don't be afraid, for I've come to bring you good news, the most joyous news the world has ever heard. And it is for everyone, everywhere. For today in Bethlehem, a rescuer was born for you. He is the Lord Yahweh, the Messiah. You will recognize him by this miracle sign. You will find a baby wrapped in strips of cloth, swaddling clothes, and lying in a manger in a feeding trough. Then all at once, a vast number of glorious angels appeared, the very armies of heaven. <laughs> Guess why? Because the Lord of heaven's armies, yes. And they all praise God, singing glory to God in the highest realms of heaven, for there is peace and a good hope is given to the sons of men. When the choir of angels disappeared back to heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go, let's hurry and find this word that is born in Bethlehem and see for ourselves what the Lord has revealed to us. So they ran into the village and found their way to Mary and Joseph. And there was the baby lying in a feeding trough. Praise the Lord. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for Christmas, Lord. We thank you for each other. We thank you for family, those, oh God, who you've put in our lives, even from our birth, oh God, and then those you've put in our lives from our new birth, oh God. We thank you that you've, you've given us life. Lord, we are alive, we are well, and we're fully restored. And I thank you for that, God. I stand on that word today. I stand on your promises. And God, I ask for your anointing this morning. I pray, oh God, that whatever I'll say in these next few minutes, oh God, is going to just breathe life into the lives of your people. Lord, we thank you for the gift of Christmas. We thank you for the gift of your holy birth. We thank you for the gift of your only begotten Son. In Jesus' name, amen. Today, I just want you to smile at somebody across the room, especially if you're you're Scroogey this morning because we're not going to do a whole lot of hugging today okay we're going to respect each other's space this morning and hey Tim good to see you smile at somebody across the room and and, and give them your best Merry Christmas hello I'm just going to start calling some of you guys Ebenezer that was going to be my sermon today and when you're done you may have your seats Look, after the rapture, when Ollie is stuck here, I have thousands of people here with Ollie. That'll be very difficult to do, so do it now. You look nice. Okay. Ollie, you look nice. Doesn't Pastor Kurt's suit look nice this morning? <laughs> Imagine if you had a haircut to go with that suit. It would have been like... <laughs> it would have been like on point. <laughs> He still is on point. <laughs> Praise the Lord. God is good. I hope you guys have fantastic plans for the day. I hope that you guys have plans better than just staying home and um, worried about COVID. Stay home, but don't worry about COVID. That night in a field near Bethlehem, shepherds are having an ordinary day. As most of you decided already, many of you decided this day was going to be because things are not perfect, right? Tell your friend far away, say it ain't perfect. And this is exactly the situation that Mary and Joseph is in right now. Pastor, you're going to preach about Christmas? Yes, it's Christmas Day. I only get to do this once a year. Leave me alone. And so Mary and Joseph do not have perfect circumstances, especially my girl Mary. She's nine months along. She is with child. And she has just ridden on a donkey for three days. Anybody think that's a good idea? No, it's not a good idea, especially nine months into it, especially being 15 years old, especially never having having given birth before, riding on rocky roads. It's nothing like the freeway. It is rocky terrain. And this poor little thing has been on this donkey and Joseph pulling her along. Why? Because they're journeying to Bethlehem. 
They don't live in Bethlehem. They just have to go to Bethlehem in order for the census to take place. This is the first census. Caesar Augustus has called a census. What does that mean? This is the year of the census, isn't it? What? Does somebody say that? That's no coincidence either. Some of you are like, whoa. Look, if you're still in like sign mode, you still need signs that God spoke to us this year in such a mighty way. You'll never get another sign as good as the ones we've had this year. There are so many, many of them everywhere. But yeah, it was the census year and they traveled into Bethlehem. Guess why? Because both Mary and Joseph were of the lineage of David. Both of them, and that's how two of the Gospels tell you where Jesus came from. Because the, the, the Messiah has to come from David's line, from David's bloodline. Whether he came through Mary or whether he came through Joseph, we know he came through Mary. Then it would have been okay because both of them came down from, from David. And that's why when a census happens, you go back to where you were born or where your lineage is from. And that's where you're counted. So um, I don't know, I, I guess I can make this a little bit clearer even if you become a naturalized citizen of the United States of America they always ask you two questions they say where is your residence and where were you born it doesn't matter if you are a, a citizen or not, your nationality or uh, your, uh, wherever you are birthed, your place of birth is matters. And you know, after about 50 years of living in a country, I, not, I haven't reached there yet, but after about 50 years, you would think they would stop asking you where you were born. When you're like 95, where you're going to die seems to be more important than where you were born, but they're still going to ask you, where were you born? And so let's all answer. So all together, and let's see how many answers we can come up with in one big, loud, happy noise. Ready? Where were you born? Yeah. My favorite thing about this church this morning is that everybody didn't shout Trinidad. Because I would have dropped this mic and leave this place. Because I told the Lord, I don't want that church. I don't want that Trinity church. That's that other one down the road. And I most certainly didn't want the Guyanese church. That's the other one down the road. And I didn't want the Jamaican church because that's the other one down the road. And I didn't want the Haitian church because that's that other one down the road. And you're like, wait, it's not this one? No. No, it's not. Um, this is the one, this one here is the one where every, every single nationality and every creed, every race, every color is welcome because this is the house of God. This is the one where our citizenship is in heaven, right? And so uh, they ask you, where were you born? And that, that's, that's because it's important. Where you were born says certain things about you. Now, um, so Mary and Joseph go back to what is supposed to be their hometown. If this was an ordinary year, that's probably where we would be going. Um, after service today, we would all be on an airplane, dude, flying down to, to Trinidad because that's where we're from. That's where our parents are and um, our family. And so because when we go home, things are a little bit different, right? How many of you have family back home? All right. The rest of you, all your family moved here. But there's something about when you go home. It's home to family's house. My mom, it, 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 I always complain that Facebook has really killed family time. Because long ago, when you go home, you could talk for hours. You could talk for days about everything that's going on with everybody and your cousin and your, your did you know and, and did you hear and so and so graduated but now everybody know everything within seconds of everything happening. You can't bring up anything that anybody has not yet heard about and heard more than you heard about because they read more comments. But when you go home, you can put your feet up. You can go straight to the refrigerator. You know where your bed is. You know that they will make a space on the floor for you. And you don't mind sleeping on the floor in your home. Well, guess what? Mary and Joseph has no choice. They're there for the census, but they're in their hometown. So don't ever feel like maybe, you know, um, they're in a stable, put out in the middle of nowhere. They are, but they're home. They are there. They are in a strange place. They don't have an upper room, but they're home. But three things I want to sh just show you about, about um, this story that is not just a story, but it is the story of your salvation and my salvation. For the rest of the day, you'll have all the time in the world. Most of us would not have woken up before 9 o'clock if you're not female and mother. 
If your female and mother, you would have woken up three hours ago anyway. Amen? Amen. In fact, most of you already have a ham in the oven or it baked. Sharon Lee says ham is done. <laughs> Just want you guys to know that. But on this day, one angel, say one angel. One angel appeared to the shepherds. I know we think it's a host, but the host didn't appear yet. One angel appeared to the shepherds. And the Bible says that one angel lit up the whole sky and the whole field. I wonder what Gabriel, if it was him, thought about that moment. Because all of eternity, all of heaven waited for all of eternity for the moment when the king of glory would come down to earth. And for those of you who don't know, I just want to remind you that Jesus took on humanity. He became flesh. He was all God, but he was all man at the same time. I, I wonder if, if there was ever a conversation in heaven about whether Jesus should come down as a fully grown man. He could have. No, he's God. He could have come down at 12. He could have come down when boys were bar mitzvah. And he could have come down at 21 when he was legally an adult in the United States. So he could have turned that water into wine and all that stuff. But no, he came down as a newborn baby. He came the way you came. I think that's very significant that he said, if I was going to experience what they are going to experience, I'll do it from the first moment. And I want you to know that Jesus was holy since before he was in his mother's womb. Nobody could tell me at three months of gestation that Jesus wasn't the son of God. He was already the son of God from the moment that the spirit of the Lord overshadowed Mary. That thing which was inside of her was of the Holy Spirit. And I believe it's the same way we live in a country right now where someone is not considered viable until they take their first breath on their own you're not even considered a human being until you can breathe on your own but I want to give God praise that he knit us in the middle of our mother's belly that he fitly formed us that he knows our way he knows every cell in your body he knows the way you were made he knows every hair on your head this is is the God that is intimately aware of the way that you were put together and that oh my gosh that makes me so excited that means nothing can happen to me that he is not aware of and he doesn't know how to fix it one angel filled the whole sky with glory and the first thing he said to them is don't be afraid I've come to bring you the most joyous news the world has ever heard and it is for everyone, everywhere. And, and, and the one thing that, that the Spirit of the Lord said to get across to you this morning is that this is news for everyone, everywhere. We don't get that because everyone sounds like a collective word. Everyone sounds like it's generalized, doesn't it? If I say I have something for everyone this morning, how many of you are going to get it? Everybody. But the word everyone is also, as it is collective, it's singular. There are two singular, singular words in the word everyone, every and one. And it's very individual. It's very, the word individual itself means it's undividable. Every one, even though it means all of us, it means one of us. I, I need you to get it in your spirit. He said, this is for everyone, everywhere. You know what that meant? You know what that meant to me? Jesus was coming for the shepherds. But he was also coming for the wise men. This is good news for the shepherds, but it's also good news for the wise. It is good news for the pauper, and it is good news for the prince. It is good news for hierarchy, and it's good news for homeless people. It is good news for Herod. It was good news for Christians who didn't even exist yet, but it was also good news for the Asians, and it was good news for the black man, and it was good news for the white man, and it was good news for those that would believe, and good news for those that would never believe. It was good news for those that would love him, and good news for those that would crucify him. The birth of Jesus would, was good news for everyone, everywhere. It hit me so hard that it did not matter whether they accepted him, whether they loved him, whether they believed him it was still good news it doesn't matter whether you love him whether you accept him whether you believe him whether you call him Lord it is still good news Christmas is still good news good news which shall be to all people everyone everywhere 
Amidst all the stress, the anxiety, the fretting, hope was born in a manger. One woman, one man. One woman. So far we had one angel, right? Now it's one woman, one man. If the Bible says that new hope has come, the angel said, look, I've come to bring a new hope. We think, well, from now on, the shepherd should have a new job. Because if God came to fix things, then I should be fixed. The shepherds should no longer have the worst possible job on the planet because the shepherds in Bethlehem at the time, by the way, lived on the outside. They were like the poorest of the poor, right? The ones who couldn't do anything else tended the sheep. That's kind of how people still think about pastors. Isn't it though? Most pastors, I mean, a lot of pastors, they do it because they can't do anything else. Wait, no, that didn't come all right. Let me say it again. Most, a lot of pastors pastor because they think it's easy. That still didn't come out right. Look, I don't even know what I'm trying to say. I just don't understand why so many people think that this is the job for them. I don't get it. My mom used to say, look, go shovel dirt. She's like, she's telling me, and I'm a girl, become a carpenter. There's nothing wrong with carpentry. It's just for me. I'm just not cut out for it. She's like, do anything. Don't do this unless God calls you to do this. Amen. Seriously, this is not something. Shepherding is a difficult job because sheep are a stubborn animal. Yeah. <laughs> you know what a sheep would do? He would put himself... To hang over a cliff. Big old field of green right here. But there's one little tuft of grass in a very precarious and, and deathly cliffside. And that sheep will leave the whole field and go there to eat that. And then the shepherd has to leave the 99 and go to the edge of the cliff to grab a sheep by its neck and bring it from the cliff. That's why Jesus said, look, I'm the good shepherd. I understand your stubbornness. I understand that the grass always looks greener to you on the other side. I understand that your whole life is about what you didn't get and what you don't have. But on this day, I'm, I just want to move on because I know it's a long day for you. We think that the coming of Jesus was supposed to mean a new life for the shepherds, exaltation for Mary, fame for Joseph. I, I, I mean, they're the parents of God. This is a big deal. I mean, there are angels announcing this thing. The whole world should, it should indelibly from that moment on be changed. Everybody should live different. Things should be different. But Kurt, I've noticed something about God. He's a process kind of God. He's a God who would allow us to care for him. Allow one girl, one man to, to raise him and to nurture him and to feed him, clothe him, change him, hear him cry. Why would God, when the Bible says, and God humbled himself, even to the form of a servant, it is the ultimate humility to give up your right to do anything for yourself. And do you understand that that's what Jesus did when he came here? He didn't come 2,000 years ago, 2,000. 30 years ago to impact humanity on a collective level even though he would for God so loved the world he came to impact everyone he would change Mary forever by the time he gets to the cross Joseph is dead by the time he gets to the cross Mary is a widow by the time he is hanging on a tree bruised battered and dying and, and and weeping with tears his mother is standing by the cross looking at her son die and she is a widow but her life has been indelibly affected by the little boy that she had a chance to raise by the son of God that was put in the middle of her womb this Mary would never be the same one girl one man. This word was given to everyone, everyone. The third thing. Everyone is without exclusion. That means on eight days after Jesus was born, he goes into the temple. And there's a little lady there and her name is 
Anna. Right? For those of you who ever wondered where the word Anna came from, that's where that she is a she is a prophetess. She is in the temple. The Bible says she's there day and night. You know how old they say she was? About 104. She was a widow. She was a widow for over 70 something or 80 something years. And, and, and lost her husband when she was a teenager. And every day since that day, she was in the temple. And the minute she saw Jesus, she knew, she recognized him. And the minute she saw him, she began to prophesy that the Messiah had come. What about Simeon? Simeon waited all his life, but he had a promise. Just like some of us here, when the Lord says to us, look, I'm coming back. People laugh when they hear you say that Jesus is coming back. But you know what? God had revealed to Simeon that he would never die before he saw the Messiah with his own eyes and then one day 2,000 years ago one man one woman walks in with one baby and Simeon is in the temple on that day he takes one look at the Messiah one look at Jesus Christ and says now Lord now your servant can die because my eyes have seen the glory. In other words, he said, just like you said it. You said I would not depart until I saw the glory. And today, I live long enough. Ruthie, wouldn't it be something if he splits the eastern sky? If we go up to meet him and we can look at him and say, Lord, you said it. You said I wouldn't die until I got to see you. And here you are. I'm still alive. And I got to see you like Job. We can say the worms may eat this flesh. Yet with my eyes, I will see God. Wouldn't it be? I mean, it is the hope of the Christian. It is 2,000 years ago that the hope was born. Because Jesus came, we know that he is coming again. Can we rejoice that he is coming again? It was good news for blind Bartimaeus because without Jesus, he would have been blind for the rest of his life. It was good news for Zacchaeus and the woman with the issue of blood. It was good news for the woman at the well. Hmm. But it was good news for Pilate. And it was good news for a Roman soldier who would pound nails into Jesus' hand. 33 years after that baby was born, there was a soldier that put the nail straight through the sinew and the muscles of Jesus' wrist. And with heartless, he didn't even think about what he was doing because to think that this was a man could probably affect his humanity. But he took that hammer and he pounded the nails and heard my Jesus scream, but it was still good news for him because as Christ lay on the cross and he said father forgive them that same Roman soldier looked up and good news hit his heart he said surely 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 this was the son of God you know why it was good news for Herod the Bible says when the wise men came to Herod and said, where is he who is born king of the Jews? Show us where he is. Herod was very, very troubled. You ever wondered why he was troubled? Because three men come with three little boxes. Think about it. We three kings is biblically inaccurate. Because the Bible never says there were three kings. It just says there were three gifts. But King Herod gets the bible says so terrified how many of you if you see three kings coming with gifts it will just shake you to your core nobody think about it what on earth would have terrified let me tell you what would terrify a king if kings show up jude if an entourage of kings show up and they come bearing gifts, I mean gifts of gold, of frankincense and myrrh. And they come to you and say, where is he who is born the king of the Jews? You know why Herod is terrified? Because legally he is known as the king of the Jews. But legally he's not supposed to be. This is not a religious thing. This is political. Herod is not actually a Jew. And only a Jew can be king of the Jews. Neither is Herod a Roman citizen. So Caesar could not have appointed him as king of the Jews. Herod was king of the Jews because of his daddy. 
and his dad did some stuff that made Caesar give him the rule over Judea. So Herod inherited it, and he was such a megalomaniac, and he was so scared and, and cynical and, and suspicious, killed his own firstborn sons, killed his wife, and on his death, because he knew nobody would cry, he arrested every official in Judea, had them arrested and put in a dungeon and said, on the day that Herod dies, on the day I die, kill everybody. He said, kill them all because even if they're not crying for me, they're going to cry. That is Herod. Very, very protective of the throne. And here comes an entourage of wise men, of magi, people from Persia, people from Iraq. Here comes a bunch of people, a bunch of kings of wise men with gifts and these are not ordinary gifts you didn't give gold to commoners you only gave gold to kings and they're bringing gold and they're bringing frankincense you didn't give frankincense to commoners it was the priest who could use the frankincense and they were bringing loads of frankincense and then they were bringing myrrh you didn't give myrrh to just anybody you gave myrrh to somebody who's dead. Or somebody with a death in their family. On the day that the wise men showed up for Jesus and they brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh, you know what they were saying? They were saying, you are king. You are prophet. You are priest. You are king. You are prophet. You are priest. He is the prophet. He is the priest. He is the king. And these men were acknowledging that right there. The day they followed a star all the way to where the baby. No wonder Herod was terrified because king of the Jews showed up. Somebody who was legally the king of the Jews. Herod had to believe it was so. He had to because he told them, he said, go find him. Come back and tell me. So I too can worship him. How did he presume to worship him? The Bible said he asked them, when did you first see the star? Why do you think he asked them that? Go back and read your Bible. Herod actually says, when did you first see the star? So he could count nine months down the road. I could ask you, when did you first see the star? Some of you are like, wait, 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 wait. Pastor. The last thing I want to say, and I'm going to send you home to open presents. The shepherd show up at the manger. You'd close my off. The shepherd show up at a manger, at a stable, and there's this little girl who's 15. Judith. Oh my gosh. Judith, stand up and let them know who don't know you see you. This is Judith. She turned 15 last week. <clears throat> you sit. <clears throat> How very fitting. Because the day I showed up in Queens for the first time, guess what I saw? A baby. I saw Judith in a stroller with her mom by a traffic light. Never seen her before, never seen Judith before. I knew her mom. Her mom was in my youth group. I was Omi's youth pastor decades before. And I didn't recognize Judith. The shepherds show up looking for unto you is born this day in the city of David, the Savior, which is Christ the Lord, and this shall be a sign. For you will find the baby wrapped in strips of cloth and lying in a feeding trough. I'm not sure what they expected to see, but if you saw angels, right? Wouldn't you expect the thing that they're pointing to to be glorious? Them shepherds took off running. And when they got there, all they saw was a little girl and a baby wrapped up in some white cloth. And Joseph just there because men just don't know what to do after they just witness what they just witnessed. <laughs> I 
And I can imagine one shepherd, like, trying to peer over into the little manger, and Mary's like, no, come. The shepherd's like, no, this is what happened. The Bible said they told everything. They said, we were just there. We were, we were out in the fields. We were just doing our thing. And all of a sudden, the whole sky lit up. Now, you got to know, Mary doesn't know this happened. They're there telling her. They said, we were just there. And all of a sudden, this angel appears. And the whole sky lights up. And, and girl, the whole field was lit up. And they said, go to Bethlehem and you'll find this baby lying in a manger. And she said, they told you where he was going to be. And the shepherd said, yes, they said he would be wrapped up in cloth. And she's like, but I just, I just tore up this cloth to wrap him up. She's like, come closer. And I imagine that the shepherd, the little old shepherd looked in there and started unwrapping what was just a baby that was a few hours old. And something very strange happened. He recognized him. Jesus didn't recognize the shepherd, you know. The shepherd recognized Jesus. How do I know that? Because the angel said, you'll know him. You'll know him. You'll recognize him. And let me tell you the real gift of Christmas. You can recognize God. Because he always knew you. But Christmas means you can know him. It was the one time when God said, I'm going to make myself available to you. In fact, I'm not just going to be available to you. I'm going to be available for you to care for for you to love, for you to know. It wasn't about him knowing me. It was about me knowing him. There's an old song that we used to sing that says, one day when I see him, I shall know him. I shall know him. But I won't know him because he's wrapped up in cloth. Because 2,000 years ago, they went to find him wrapped up. They ran to the tomb. And guess what? The same way he came was the same way he left. All wrapped up. But God, they didn't find him this time. In Tawana, the cloth was there, but the king was gone. And Kurt, one day I'm going to see him again and I will know him. And I will recognize him. But you know how I'm going to know him? I'm going to know him by the prince of the nails. Even if he showed up here, that's how you'd know him. By the prints of the nails in his hand. What a thing to mention on Christmas Day. But even as she wrapped him up that day, I believe the day they took him down from the cross and she wrapped him up again. How could she not go back to the day when the shepherds said, and the angel said, his name will be called Emmanuel, God with us. Not us with God, you know, God with us. So this is the greatest gift that was ever given to everyone, everywhere, that God is with us. And he will always be with us. Can we rejoice in that this Christmas? Hallelujah!